Throughout history, in what ways has sexual temptation destroyed many lives? Think about that for just a moment. Yeah, you know, what are some common sexual sins that people fall into today? Listen, grab your Bible, come on back and join us. We're going to take a look at Joseph and Potiphar's wife out of Genesis chapter 39 in just a moment. Hey folks, welcome to the Wednesday evening Bible study of Central Baptist Church in Oak Ridge, North Carolina. Uh, just a moment ago, I asked you, uh, what are some common sexual sins that people fall into uh, today? As we've looked back through, through history, we have seen how uh, sexual temptation has destroyed many lives. It's destroyed many families, and its, it's dis destruction has been just devastating uh, in so many areas. Well, today we're going to look at a passage uh, where uh, we see uh, one of God's children have to uh, uh, essentially be faced with, uh, with sexual temptation. Today we're going to be looking uh, at passages out of Genesis chapter 39. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn on over there if you would. Uh, and we're going to look at, at Potiphar's uh, wife. Now, let me go ahead and give you a little bit of background uh, in, in today's story leading into today's uh, text. Yeah, it, Joseph was his father's favorite son, uh, although that uh, created some issues along the way uh, in and of itself. His brothers decided that uh, they were going to try to get rid of him. In fact, they were going to kill him. Uh, but instead of doing that, they, uh, they threw him into a pit and they were just going to leave him there uh, essentially uh, to die. They, they went and, in fact, they, they took his coat of many colors and, and went and told their father that, uh, uh, that he had been killed. But uh, instead of killing him, they decided that they would uh, sell him into... Uh, into slavery in a caravan that was on its way uh, going to Egypt. Uh, so they did just that. Well, when uh, Joseph gets down uh, to Egypt, uh, he is sold again, and he is sold into the house of Potiphar. Now, uh, Joseph was doing such a good job in Potiphar's household uh, that, that he was essentially in charge of everything. Potiphar trusted him. Uh, there was no problem at all. But then when we get to today's scripture, uh, we start to see where, where, where things start to get a little sideways. Now, think about it for a moment. How many times in life have you been going along and things have been going really, really well? You know, you're like, oh man, this is great. And then something uh, throws that monkey wrench in the works. Uh, you're going, if this just wasn't happening, things would be perfect. If this was different, you know, and let me make you a promise. As a believer, Satan is going to try everything he can to throw things at you uh, to try to get you off track. Now, Joseph maintained uh, his, his walk with God. Joseph was a, was a righteous man, uh, and he was walking in, in the ways of righteousness. Let's, let's say it in that manner. Uh, so when these things began to come up, yeah, I, I've often looked at Joseph's life and said, if there was ever a guy you know, who had the right to say, Lord, why me? Yeah, Joseph was that guy. Now, some of you that are, that are viewing this broadcast uh, this evening are thinking the same thing. In your life, you've thought, Lord, why me? You know, I'm trying to do the best I can. Why does it seem like uh, those who are not your children uh, prosper, and yet those that are that are trying to do right just keep hitting roadblock after roadblock, speed bump after speed bump? Well, you know, we're going to look at, at uh, one of uh, Joseph's temptations <clears throat> in our passages that we're going to look at today. So turn with me, if you would, Genesis chapter 39, and uh, we're going to look at uh, that, that chapter. It's essentially 23 verses, um, so uh, just bear with me as, uh, as we take a reading of them. Genesis chapter 39, uh, beginning with verse 1, it says, Now Joseph uh, had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him uh, from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Uh, the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a, a successful man, and he was in the house uh, of his master, the Egyptian. Verse 3, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor uh, in sight and served him. Uh, then uh, he made him overseer of his house, and all that, that he had, he put under his authority. Verse 5, so it was uh, from the time that, that he made him overseer of his house, uh, that all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, uh, and the blessing of the Lord was on all that, that he had in the house and in the field. Thus, he left all that he had in Joseph's hands, and he did 
Uh, he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now, Joseph uh, was, a handsome, uh, was handsome in form and appearance. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast uh, longing eyes on Joseph. Uh, and she said, lie with me. But he refused uh, and, and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know uh, what is, is with me in, in the house, and he has uh, committed all that he has into my hand. Uh, there, is, uh, there, there is no one greater uh, in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me uh, but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Uh, so it was that as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph uh, went into the house uh, to do his work <laughs> and none of the men of the house was inside that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and, and ran outside. Verse 13, so it was when she saw uh, that, that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, that she called to the men uh, of her house and spoke to them saying, see, uh, he has uh, brought in to us a, a Hebrew to mock us. He came, in, uh, he came in to me to lie with me and, and I cried with a loud voice. Uh, and it happened uh, when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until, uh, until his master came home. Verse 17, then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, the Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. And so it was, when his master uh, heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me uh, after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place uh, where the king's prisoners were confined. Uh, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor uh, in the sight of the keepers of the prison. Uh, and the keepers of the prison uh, uh, committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the, in the prison. Uh, whatever they did there, uh, it was his doing. Uh, final verse 23 says, The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you this evening, we just ask that you would give us insight into your word. Lord, we realize that uh, each and every place that, that we go and in each and everything that we do, Satan is doing his very, very best to, to tempt us and to try to trip us up. And Lord, uh, it, it is amazing that in the area of uh, sexual misconduct that Satan just tries to capture God's people and pull them astray. Lord, I pray that we will be able to take uh, notes of what we read today about Joseph that we might make applicable to our lives that we could truly resist temptation of all kinds, but especially sexual temptation. Lord, we realize that the, the world does not like you, and because it does not like you, it does not like us, and therefore it is after us. Lord, help us to not grow weary in well-doing along our journey. Father, be with me, your messenger, for these moments that you would truly be high and lifted up. Draw all men unto you, Lord, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, when we look at this particular passage, uh, I mentioned a, a moment ago that if there was ever a, a cause for a guy to be able to say, hey, Lord, what is going on? Why is this happening to me? You know, I'm trying to do the right thing. All these things are taking place. Yeah, I've often said this, when you go back and you look at Joseph, it wasn't his fault that, it, that he was his father's favorite son. Now, there was a little bit of fault when, when it, it almost seemed like he was rubbing it in a little bit with his brothers there in the early going. Uh, but yet, that, still, it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault that he was uh, sold into slavery. It wasn't his fault that, uh, uh, that he was sold into Potiphar's household. It wasn't his fault that, that, that he was a good-looking man. Uh, it wasn't his fault that, that Potiphar's wife had eyes 
uh, for him. So therefore, you know, he's sitting back going, what could I have done to make things any different? Now, I want to just interject something right here, that God has a plan and God has a purpose for each and everything that happens and takes place in our life. As we look at the life of Joseph, uh, and I may get a little bit ahead of myself right here, we can see how everything that happened in his life was God bringing him to where he wanted and needed for him to be to accomplish his will, uh, his purpose, and his glory. We know that in, the, in this uh, particular story of Joseph that later on his own family would even have to come to him for food, which without uh, they, would have, they would have suffered and died. So that's a, that's a little bit of a freebie. That's, a, that's on out there ahead. But let's look at what's taking place in these particular passages uh, that, that are our focus uh, today. So in our story, Joseph was sold as a slave to Potiphar, who was an Egyptian officer. Now, even in his great affliction, there was somebody, according to verse 1 and 2, that was with Joseph. And we know who that was. God was with him. In, in the greatest times of his affliction, God never left him. God never forsook him. And, and, and in fact, one of the things that the Word tells us, particularly in this story of Joseph, not only in our text for today, but the whole story of Joseph goes on and it says that everything that Joseph did prospered uh, because he had turned it over to the Lord. Uh, there were a series of good things that happened uh, in Joseph's life simply because the Lord was with him. Even in the text that we're, that we're looking at uh, this evening, it talks about how when he went into Potiphar's household, you know, Potiphar saw that everything Joseph did prospered. So he pretty much put everything in his household into Joseph's hands. And in, in fact, the word says... Uh, that Potiphar didn't even know what he had. He said all, all he knew was that he showed up for dinner and dinner was there. He didn't know as far as uh, money-wise what he had. Uh, Joseph ran the household and did a phenomenal job because God was blessing him along the way. Uh, just, just a couple of the good things that we see that are going on in Joseph's life, even in the midst of the tragic things that are taking place. Okay, Now, when we walk close, uh, uh, close with the Lord, uh, we have to watch out for Satan. Satan is always out there trying to uh, throw this snare out. He's always trying to do something uh, to, to trip us up or, or to catch up. Uh, so what happened was uh, Satan did something uh, to Joseph there in verse 7. Let's go look at verse 7. Uh, verse 7 tells us this. It says that, that, that after it came to pass that, that after these, these things, that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and she said, lie with me. Potiphar's wife was very upfront. She looked at Joseph. She said, this guy is a handsome fella. You know, I think I want to lie with him. Now, for the sake of maybe children being around, uh, you adults understand what I'm talking about, what she actually went and asked of him. She didn't beat around the bush. She said, Joseph, I want you to lie with me. Now, verse 8 goes on and says, but he refused uh, and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know uh, what is is with me in the house. Now, that, that could have meant a lot of things. That meant he doesn't know how much money he's got. He doesn't know any of that because it's all been entrusted to me. I think it also means that he doesn't understand how you are. Uh, my master doesn't understand what you are doing in seducing me and what you are doing by coming to me uh, with this request. Verse 8, but he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house uh, and he has committed all that he has into my hand. Joseph was grateful uh, for that fact. Joseph uh, realized his position, and it was a position that, uh, that, that he took very seriously. Now, folks, I want to tell you that even in the midst of things that seem to be going sideways in your life, begin to look around for God's blessing. Begin to look uh, around at where you are. I love how the Word tells us this. It says that we need to whatsoever state we're in therewith, to be content. Are you content in the state that you're in? Now, I don't mean, do you want to stay in those particular places? I'm sure that that, that Joseph wasn't happy that, that his brothers didn't like him. He wasn't happy that he was sold into slavery. He wasn't uh, happy that, that he was considered a slave rather than a, a, a free citizen. But even in the midst of all that, God was continuing to prosper him and continuing to bless him uh, in such a fashion that could be used for his honor, for his glory. So if you find yourself in that situation where you're like, I don't like where I am, begin to look around and see where you see God showing up in the midst. Begin to see where God's hand is at work in your life and where he is trying to use you 
to bring about honor and glory uh, for his name. So, you know, Satan uh, approaches him essentially through, <clears throat> through his master, which is Potiphar, through his wife, uh, and puts a very tempting situation out there in front of, uh, in front of Joseph. Uh, so how did Joseph respond to this seductive invitation of Potiphar's wife? Well, verses 7 through 9 uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Now, folks, you got to understand, this wasn't a one-shot deal. It wasn't where Potiphar's wife came in and said to Joseph, lie with me, and Joseph said, man, I can't do that. You know, you, you, I, that's just a. It's not right to do. You know, I am your husband's servant. That's just that's just not the right thing to do. He didn't just say that one time. Uh, evidently, according to the scripture, this was a repeated process. Potiphar's wife kept on approaching uh, Joseph and kept on saying, "Lie with me, lie with me." She was being very persistent. Maybe you could say she was nagging him uh, about that situation, and every time. Uh, Joseph turned her down. Well, if, if you've ever been in that situation where there's been rejection before, particularly if you're in a position of authority or power, much like Potiphar's wife was, they don't like to take no for an answer. So uh, she uh, manipulates the situation. She gets uh, somewhat forceful uh, with Joseph in this situation. She actually lays hold of him. She grabs hold of him and says, I want you to lie with me. Now, Joseph yeah, but because of the situation, he was almost backed into a corner. It says that she had a hold of his uh, his garment, and, and what happened was trying to get away from her. He even came out of his garment, so she is standing there holding his garment. Now, he did the right thing. He, he got away from her. He left. He did not fall to the temptation, and yet because of that cloak in her hand, she used that as evidence against him to bring up the false accusation. She actually accused Joseph of doing something that he did not do. She accused Joseph of doing what she wanted him to do, but yet he didn't do. Now, there's, uh, there's some truth uh, uh, realized uh, about uh, sexual sin uh, that many don't seem to realize today. Let's look at verse 9, the latter part of, uh, of verse 9. Well, let's just take the whole verse 9. It says, there is no greater one in this house than I. This is Joseph speaking uh, to Potiphar's wife. There is no one greater in the house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you. In other words, he's saying, I have pretty much rule and control over everything except you. You are his wife. You are off limits. Latter part of verse 9, because you are his wife. Now, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God. Now, you notice, too, that he didn't say sin against Potiphar. He didn't say sin against you. He didn't say even sin against my own body. He said sin against God. How can I do this? Folks, let me ask you a question. When is the last time that you looked at the great blessings that God has bestowed in your life and said, how can I succumb to the temptation and do this to, to the God who loves me, the God who takes care of me, the God who provides for me, the God who has, has caused me to prosper. Once again, notice the latter part of verse 9. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So he's, he, he's putting it right out there to her. You know, this is something that, that, that Joseph realized. He didn't just all of a sudden realize it. He knew it. He set those boundaries. He knew that was off limits. Folks, we need to set boundaries in our lives, and we need to know that there are certain things that are off limits. Do not mess with temptation. Satan will bait you to the edge of the cliff of temptation, and then when you fall over, he will chastise you for that. Don't fall into his plan. Don't fall into his scheme, especially when it comes down to sexual sin. You know, why do you think you know, Satan kept coming back uh, with this same temptation day after day after day? You know, remember what we said. It wasn't a one-shot deal with Potiphar's wife. She kept on approaching and kept on approaching and kept on approaching. You know, sometimes what happens is people just get worn down with temptation and give in to it. Now, let me tell you, Satan is persistent. He knows every little chink in our armor. Now, I'm not saying uh, that, that Joseph, you know, had a problem with, with sexual sin. Obviously, he stood great in the temptation that we're reading about today. But I'll tell you, this is one of the temptations that, that many people succumb to. It is, it, it is very tempting because 
Uh, it is a pleasurable thing. It is something that maybe we want or desire. And the thing that keeps us from doing such a thing are A, marriage commitments. B, the fact that we know that we would be uh, you know, hurting our God. C, uh, there could be a trail of destruction. If you look back up, nothing good has ever come uh, from, from sexual sin. You know, I like how the Bible calls it. He, he talks oftentimes that there is pleasure in sin for a season. But what about after that season? I mean, uh, there, there's long-term ramifications to these things. So Satan did not give in to Satan's temptation. Now, a lot of you all watching tonight know that. There is, there is something in your life Satan knows about it, and he just keeps on nagging. He keeps on picking. He keeps on bringing you that temptation time after time, day after day after day. It is something that you see on a continual basis. And, and you sit back and say, Lord, why does this keep on happening? Listen, I want to encourage you, continue to stand strong against that temptation. You know, before long, Satan's going to have to give up. Before long, now, and, and I say that, but you know, he may not. He may continue to keep on trying to trip you up uh, with the thing. And if you ever notice, it's the things that often we struggle with that Satan loves to keep putting out in, in front of our lives, to keep tempting us with, to keep dangling uh, the carrot out in front of our nose and trying us to go toward it. Now, you know, Potiphar's wife um, uh, did something on her final attempt to seduce Joseph down there in uh, verses 11 through 12. Let's take a look at what that was. In verses 11 through 12, it says this. It says, but it happened uh, that about this time when Joseph uh, went, uh, went into the house to do his work, uh, and none of the men of a house were inside. Wow, Satan has a way of making things happen the way he wants to, doesn't it? Nobody was there. It was a perfect opportunity for Potiphar's wife uh, to essentially go for the juggler when it comes down to the temptation, okay? Nobody's there except for her and Joseph. Verse 12 says that she caught him by his garment. She laid hands on him. She grabbed a hold of him and said, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled running out of the house. You know, I, I don't know whether Joseph was scared to death in that situation. I don't know what it was. I know that he was extremely uncomfortable with it. But one of the things that he did in light of that was to get away from her because she had a hold of that, uh, that cloak. Yeah, he even spun around, got, got out of it and left it. He said, I'm not going to stay around. I am going to do actually what the Bible tells you and I to do. Flee from temptation. Don't flirt with it. Don't get close to it. Don't even try to keep it at arm's length. Get away from it. And Joseph did just that. Now, there were some ways uh, that, that, that Joseph gives us an example to follow when we're facing sexual temptation. Get away from it. That's what he can teach us. Remember what we've said. We've always looked for examples to follow in God's word as we do our Bible studies. This is a great example to follow. When you realize that you are in the midst of that temptation, you need to start looking for the way of escape. God's word tells us there have no temptation given you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful. He'll not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation provide a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. So don't sit there and flirt with it. Get away from it, even if it means leaving your cloak uh, in the hand of the adversary, okay? This is a great example for you and I to follow. And, when, and I'm talking about Joseph, obviously. Great example to follow. Get away uh, from the temptation. We have to flee. We have to run from it. I'm going to share a verse with you out of 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 22. And it says this, 2 Timothy 2, 22 says this. It says, flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. He tells us right there, we are to do exactly what Joseph did. We are to flee from that temptation. Have we done that? Or do we toy with it? You know, I think sometimes we sit back and we say, oh, well, Lord, I'm honored. You know, I, you know, I'm honored that somebody would pay me this kind of attention. I'm honored uh, that, that, that they would. So we, we like that feeling. We always tell ourselves the same thing. I'm not going to go too far. I'm just going to bask in the, the joy of the encouragement as it were. And then the next thing you know, you find yourself succumbing to that temptation. You find yourself uh, in, in a position where you never, ever wanted to be. Folks, Satan is tricky that way. We've got to stay away from him. We've got to push him away. We've got to get away from him. 
So the same thing that, that happened uh, to Joseph is the same thing that often happens in our society today. There were some false accusations that were brought up against Joseph from Potiphar's wife. Okay, what she did was she went to her husband. She'd been rejected by Joseph. So she goes to her husband, Potiphar, and says, Joseph essentially tried to rape her. Joseph tried to seduce her. You'll find this in verses 13 through 18. Okay, and, and, and it says that, that Potiphar got, got mad at this. Now, she has just flat out lied against him. Now, what she did was she even took Joseph's cloak and said, Here's, here is uh, some evidence that, that he tried to lie with me. Look, he even left his cloak behind. Now, you and I know the real story, but imagine if you were Potiphar. You know, who would you believe? You know, I, I mean, I think that even with Joseph's track record, it might have been, you know, a moment of time where Potiphar thought, ah, I just can't see him doing that. But nonetheless, she was his wife. So therefore, what happens is Joseph winds up getting thrown in prison for doing the right thing. That does not sound just or fair, does it? How many times in our situations that, that we're going through right now do we say, Lord, that's just not fair. That just doesn't seem just. Now, one of the things as we fast forward the story, we realize that everything that happened in Joseph's life was a building block, uh, something that God was using to bring honor and glory to his name, to train Joseph so that, that Joseph would learn uh, the things God needed him to learn to be what God needed him to be down the road. So if you're in the middle of circumstances and situations right now, temptation, whatever it may be, and, and you sit back and you say, why does it always seem I get punished for doing the right thing? I want to encourage you to hang in there because God has an ultimate plan. And that ultimate plan is going to be for your best. It's going to be for your good. And it is also going to be for his honor and for his glory. Okay. Uh, this did damage to Joseph. Verses 19 and 20 tell us that, uh, the fact that he actually wound up being thrown in prison uh, for doing the right thing because Potiphar, of course, had to believe the testimony of his wife. You know, Now, I don't know, maybe you have been in a circumstance or a situation where you have been falsely accused. Have you ever been falsely accused? How did that make you feel when you had been falsely accused? Most of the time what we do is we try to run to our defense. We try to bring every piece of evidence that we can uh, to the forefront to be able to say, no, I didn't do that. Here's my proof. Here are these type things. Uh, and, and sometimes it looks really, really bleak. Okay, So it doesn't make us feel good when we've been falsely accused. accused. But what we have to do is we have to guard ourselves against false accusations. How do you do that? Listen, if you are in a place where you know that, that there could be false accusations brought against you, then get out of that place. Don't stay around. That, that goes back to what we're talking about with saying don't flirt with temptation. You know, I, I've said before, we need to set guardrails up in our lives that will that, that keep us on the right side, that keep us from having hurt, harm, or damage done to us. Places we go, things we do, people that we see, what does it bring forth in our testimony? What, what do other people think when they see uh, where we're going and what we're doing? Because people will make assessments about you based on those things. Listen, try to, to make sure that there, there are no problems whatsoever with where you go, what you do, how you say, what you say, and all these different kind of things. Try your best to guard yourself against A, temptation, and against B, false accusations. You know, most of you know how easy it is for somebody to take a story and twist it around and use it against you, even when it's not true. I would be willing to say that most of you have been in that situation where, you know, somebody has spun a story around uh, to make you look bad in a circumstance or a situation. Usually what happens is we get mad. That's what happens. We get mad. We come to our defense. And then sometimes when I say we get mad, we get mad at the people uh, who made us victims. We get mad at the circumstance. And sometimes we even get mad at God. God, if you know, why can't you just change this around? You know I didn't do anything wrong. Could Joseph have said that? Yes, he could have. He could have very easily said, I didn't do anything wrong. Why is it that I'm in this predicament, God? So if that's where you are as you view this, uh, this message tonight, I want to caution you. I want you to be very, very careful that you look at the circumstance and take it as a building block for where God wants you to go and what God wants you to do. You know, you're like Joseph. Joseph was unjustly accused, okay? Now, 
We said before that because of what happened, Potiphar has him thrown uh, into prison. And, and the, the verses go on to tell us that even in prison, God was with Joseph. And even in prison, everything that Joseph did prospered. Once again, he is now put in charge of the prisoners, a prisoner watching the prisoners because of his reputation, because of his doing good. Now, I want you to notice something that in all those steps of the way, Joseph never gave up. Joseph never gave up on God. Joseph never gave up on, on his circumstance. He, I, there's an old expression that says, bloom where you're planted. And that is exactly what Joseph did. He said, you know what? I don't like the fact that I'm in prison, but I'm going to make the best out of it. And I'm still going to do the very best I can. I'm still going to be the person who's going to produce. I'm still going to be the one who is going to deliver. And because of that, he was elevated uh, in position even within the prison. Okay. Uh, once again, a series of good things began to happen even in prison. Why did that series of good things happen? Because the Lord was with Joseph in prison. Verses 21 through 23 point that out. The Lord was there. Uh, are you trusting him? Are you relying on him? Are we too busy sitting down pouting and being angry? God, why am I in this situation? Why am I in this circumstance? I'm trying to do good. And the more I try to do good, the worse things get. Are you blooming where you're planted? Uh, is God with you? you know, are you acknowledging him? Are you allowing him to bless you through your circumstances? Okay, It's important for us to do right even when we suffer wrong. It's important for us to do good even when nobody else is watching because God is always watching. Yeah, And it's important for us to do good and to do right even amidst our trying circumstances, even in the tribulations that come forth in our life, we still need to put forth our best foot. We still need to represent our Lord and Savior in a gracious, kind, loving fashion that when others look at us, they don't see us, but they see him. Okay. Uh, we, we've often said there are important lessons that we can learn uh, through God's word. There's an important lesson that we can learn from our text today from Joseph about battling sexual temptation. You need to flee, and you need to flee quickly. Don't, don't allow it to, to take root in your life. Uh, don't sit around and, and let adulation uh, bring about joy in your life uh, because it will ultimately uh, lead to you succumbing uh, to that sexual temptation. Do it just like Joseph did immediately. When evil lays hands on you, when temptation lays hand on you, regardless of what kind of temptation it is, even if you have to leave your cloak, get away from it. That's what the word tells us to do. It says we need to flee from those things. We must not give in to sexual uh, temptations because they lead to great distress down the road. Never once has there ever been somebody that I have sat and counseled with that said, you know what, I'm so glad uh, that, that, that I had an affair. I'm so glad I did these things. No, there's damage along the way. It damages you. It damages your partner. It damages your family. It damages your children. It damages your reputation. It damages your job. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Folks, I beg you today, do not give in to sexual temptation in particular, but to any temptation. Turn it over to God. See what he's trying to do in your life through that. Bloom where you're planted. And the way that you do that is honor God, even in the midst of the trials, even in the midst of the situations that you don't like being in, okay? Even in the worst of times, there are things that we can learn from Joseph about trusting the Lord. We have to give the situation over to him and we have to say, you know what? I don't like being here, but I'm going to do the best I can do uh, with all of my heart as unto the Lord uh, to be able to be what God wants me to be right here because God knows where I am. God has allowed me to be here and God has something that he either wants me to do or wants me to learn while I'm here. And here's the really interesting part that those same lessons hold true to you and I. You're not where you are by accident. I'm not saying God put you in that situation, but I am saying God has allowed you to be in that situation and, and doing so, it can bring him honor and it can bring him glory. So let me ask you this, are you giving in to the temptation? Or are you being like Joseph and saying no, even when it means that you have to leave your cloak behind you? In just a few moments, uh, we need to pray 
for wisdom and for strength to walk close with the Lord and to flee from not only sexual temptation, but all temptations. And we're going to do that in just a moment. Before I do, I want to go ahead and give you what your Bible readings uh, for this week will be in our Bible study. Uh, this week, we're actually looking at Genesis chapter 40 through Genesis chapter 43. Once again, it's Genesis chapter 40 through Genesis chapter 43. Next week, uh, we're going to look at Joseph being exalted out of Genesis uh, chapter 41, verses 37 through 57. I do want to give you a reminder. Don't forget that on Easter Sunday, as we're approaching that, on Easter Sunday, we're going to be having a fellowship breakfast here at the church at 9.30 a.m., uh, and then we will follow that with our, uh, our Easter uh, Sunday service at 10.45 a.m. to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, to celebrate our resurrected Lord uh, as we go forward. We would love to have you come and join us for that. Again, that's going to be Easter Sunday morning, breakfast at 9.30, uh, resurrection message at 10.45 uh, a.m. Invite some friends, come on and be a part of some great things that are going on. Let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, as we come to you uh, this evening, we just ask you to give us wisdom. We ask you to give us uh, strength to be able to walk close uh, to you and to walk in your word in a way that's going to be pleasing to you. Father, we realize that Satan tries to tempt us on so many levels and particularly uh, with, uh, with sexual sins. Lord, give us uh, the, the heart and the attitude of Joseph that when those things come about, that we will not only turn our back on them, but that we will flee from them, that we will run and we will run uh, hard and fast that we might truly honor you. Lord, give us strength, give us courage, give us wisdom to be what you want us to be. As Lord, we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, folks. I look forward to seeing you in the house of the Lord on Sunday morning. Central Baptist Church, 1715 Highway 68, Oak Ridge, North Carolina.